Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Recovery Summit and today's presentation, My Recovery Story. This webinar is a part of a series hosted by St. Clair County Community Mental Health during the month of September, which is National Recovery Month. Today's session is being recorded and will be uploaded to the CMH YouTube account for future reference. So anyone who wanted to watch it again or wasn't able to see it today can certainly go on to our YouTube channel and see our presenter today and a lot of the other presentations from the Recovery Summit as well too. In the bottom of your Zoom, please feel free to use the chat box to ask any questions for Amanda and add any comments that you have during the time of the webinar. And if time allows at the end, we will be sure to get to those questions um, upon the conclusion of the presentation. A couple of housekeeping items. For those of you that have requested certificates of attendance or uh, CEUs, please make sure you remain on to the very end of the webinar to be able to get full credit for attending the webinar today. Also, we've had some questions about folks getting their um, certificates and their continuing education credits and when they will be receiving those. That will happen at the conclusion of the summit in September. Once it's done, folks will then get their certificates and it will be a certificate with all of the presentations that they attended. Um, and with that, we're gonna go ahead and talk about and introduce our presenter today. Our presenter today is Amanda Bellata. Amanda is a person in long-term recovery who has a passion for helping others overcome barriers. She works as a peer recovery coach in St. Clair County Probation and Parole. She describes her role as the most rewarding job of walking hand in hand with individuals looking to change their lives. She's currently pursuing a degree in criminal justice at SC4. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Amanda. Thank you so much. Um, thank you everyone for being here this morning. It's quite the honor to speak and share my story um, and hopefully provide some hope um, for anyone that may need it or need it for others in their lives um, that recovery is possible for any of us. Um, so I was pretty much labeled, you could say, as one of those chronic relapsers who was never going to get it. Um, I will not start there. I'll start a little bit before that. I'm from a city called Plymouth. It's kind of in between Ann Arbor and Detroit is the easiest way to explain it. I come from a good family. Um, I went to private schools growing up. And on the outside, everything appeared to be um, good. On the inside, my father struggled with alcoholism his whole life. My mother struggled with mental health. Um, so as the oldest with two younger brothers, there was a lot of responsibility that fell on me. Um, and I also now have two younger half sisters. Um, I, I'm a product of a divorced family. Um, so for me, when I, my behaviors, um, of addiction came about probably a little bit early, um, I would say around like 12 or 13, I exhibited just, you know, more on the extreme end of, um, of just behaviors of, of wanting more or being reckless or whatever, um, and then that led into me being diagnosed with ADHD. Um, I was prescribed Adderall. And unfortunately, that's where my entire addiction started. Um, so what happened was I really believed that I needed to take this pill to be able to go to school, to be able to wake up in the morning. Um, and I went to... Um, I went to an all-girl Catholic high school and I started having issues with people around me, um, which really it was always me as the issue, but I was acting out. Um, and so I somehow convinced my parents to allow me to move to the public school in Plymouth Canton, which is like a huge school. I was basically a little fish in a very big sea. And I quickly learned that by telling people that I had Adderall or access to Adderall, I started to make friends, um, which was like win-win. Um, and these friends introduced me to how if you snort Adderall, um, the 
the effects of it kind of being more magnified. Um, and that's, that's what I fell into. So then from there, I was sneaking out of the house. I was uh, abusing alcohol, abusing marijuana, abusing anything I could get my hands on really, um, any kind of prescription. And so my summer of my, what would have been my senior year and supposing to go off to college was spent in my first rehab. Um, I was sent out to a rehab in Saginaw called Kairos. Um, and I, at 17 years old, wasn't really taking any of that seriously. From there, it was suggested because my home life was so tumultuous and my mother and I just could not get along um, that I go into a three quarter house out in Taylor. So at 17 years old, coming from still kind of a sheltered life, I moved out into this three quarter house with people that um, really what I learned from was all of the drugs that I hadn't done that I was missing out on or feeling that way at that age. Um, so eventually I do, I think I was there for about nine months and convinced my parents that I was cured, that everything was behind me. Um, and I came home when I came home, I, um, started working in bars. Um, and that's really where my addiction took off. So at that point, you know, there's much more of a drug culture there. I'm, um, doing drugs at the place I worked was very acceptable. Um, so it just became kind of a lifestyle. I rode that out um, from about 18 to 25. I was able to continue to show up to work, keep my shifts, make my money. And really, I was, in my mind, living my best life, enjoying um, enjoying everything. It was still kind of a party, but somewhere around 25 things started to come unglued for me. Um, in that process, I had worked at one restaurant in particular for like seven years. Um, and they all started noticing that there was something, um, wrong with me. I was calling into shifts. My behavior was like getting even worse. Um, and so they actually sat me down and did an intervention on me and told me that they think that I need to go to treatment and all of the things. So I went because of course I wanted to save, um, my job and, and save a little bit of pride, I think. Um, and so I went and, you know, I took, I think I went to lighthouse in Plymouth um, I went through their, their program and when I came back, it was only a period of time until I was drinking again. Um, so for me, alcohol has been my biggest demon. Um, it was the easiest thing for me to get my hands on. It was, I didn't have to wait on anybody to drop it off. I could go to a store at any corner and get my fix and be happy. Um, and you know, as happy as, one could be under the influence. So from 25 to 27, I was basically um, pretty much a train wreck. I went from job to job, relationship to relationship, uh, friend to friend that would let me stay on their couch. Um, it was just horrible. It was to the point where I didn't want to live anymore. Um, I really just felt like I didn't want to keep going the way that I was going, but I didn't know that there was any other way out. Now, with that said, I did know that there was something called the 12 steps. I knew there was meetings. I knew that there were people that acted like they had found this awakening or a recovery. But I think at that point in my life, I really never believed the people when I would go to the meetings. Um, I really thought people would come to meetings and then leave and use drugs. Um, it was hard for me to get with that this was actually um, a thing, that people were actually being transformed and, and changing their lives and going completely new directions. Um, so when, so at 20, now at 27, I'm at my complete bottom. Um, I'm, I'm planning how to take my own life and I tell God I can't do this anymore. 
and I need help. So somewhere in the next few hours, I have this idea that I'll call access, which I knew how to do from being in treatment before. Um, and I'm going to tell access that I need to go from Wayne County somewhere else. Like I cannot get clean here. I cannot get sober here. Um, I need, I need to go somewhere else. So when I called access, they set me up with Sacred Heart. Um, I never had heard of Sacred Heart or Richmond, Michigan, um, but I set up a date and I got there. Um, when I got to Sacred Heart, this is in 2013, I, um, they were really um, explaining how much three quarter houses could change your life. Now, my past experience with the three quarter house although very positive in many ways and seeing that it gave me a little bit of stability and it gave me some accountability to start my life going in a positive direction. I just was at a point where I wasn't able to accept a lot of the tools that they were giving me. So they, when I heard about this place called Port Huron, they said, we can go out on a van and you can see it. And I go out on this van and I come out here and it's beautiful and there's water. And I think, well, like, you know, everything I want is on the other side of fear. That's what you're told. Um, and maybe it's time that I do this. So I really took a leap of faith. Um, I didn't know anyone out here. I didn't, I knew there were some people coming from the treatment center I was at out to Port Huron also. Um, but for the most part, it was just going to be me. Um, so when I came out here, um, things started changing for me in a very positive direction. I got a job. I started to save money. I was paying rent. I was going to meetings. I was looking for a sponsor. I was doing all of these things that were suggested to me. Um, but really, I was reverting back to some of my old behaviors, which were cleaning everything on the outside and not really taking care of the main issue, which is myself. Um, or my thinking. Um, so within a few months, I, um, I met a guy at an NA meeting and I thought he's the one, like finally, um, I'm in love. This is exactly why I was destined to come out to Port Huron was to find this gentleman. So, um, you know, they, I obviously didn't take a lot of the suggestions that were given to me, like staying out of a relationship. Um, but he was kind of the perfect project for me to work on also, um, because what better than, you know, a, a codependent in early recovery than to kind of find that relationship. So uh, we started dating, um, we got pregnant and we got married, um, actually when we still lived in the three quarter house, which is pretty wild. And, um, and shortly after having my daughter in November of 2014, we both started using again. So the thing that happened was we met in recovery and we met as people that were trying to change themselves. Um, I had no idea, nor did he, of what we were going to sign up for when we went back into active use together. Um, so I would say, so we made it through Christmas and by New Year's he was using, um, his drug of choice was opiates, um, mine being alcohol. I thought that, you know, I had this idea in my head that, um, well, being a mom will not allow me to take things to the level that I once was. Being a mom will save me because I have someone that I care more about than even myself. Um, and I couldn't have been more wrong. I had no idea how powerful my disease was and how it really was out to take everything from me. Um, so he started using, I started using, and for a few months, it was just back and forth chaos. Um, we had police at our house. I was getting arrested for warrants that I never took care of in Wayne County. Um, spending time in jail, away from my family, coming back, promising everything would be different. And then of course, nothing really changing because I wasn't sticking with any kind of solution. I was just, you know, will alone, hoping that um, I could 
I could just stop. Um, and, and I really, the ironic thing looking back is that I had so many people in my life who were like following the path of recovery and, and could help me. Um, but something in me told me that I was different, that I might be a little more broken, that just because it works for them, it doesn't mean it's going to work for me. I really had this this belief that um, I might be beyond repair and it wasn't anything I was honest about with anyone for a very long time. So in 2016, we, my husband and I would fight. Um, we had a lot of domestic violence issues going on. We had the police come to our house. I was heavily intoxicated and ended up going to jail. Um, so this was the, this was the point where I was like, okay, so there's no way I can continue going like this. I am ruining everyone's life, especially my daughter's. Um, I have to move away. You know, I wanted to run from everything again. I, I got to figure out a way out. So when I got out of jail, I found a new job. I started working. I started saving money to try to, um, to, to try to move out in secret because at that point, like there was possessive things going on where I wasn't allowed access to finances and it was just really bad. It was a very dark time in my life. I'm very grateful for all of the women that I had in my life through this process. So I, I had a sponsor through AA during all of this. I had, I had friends through, um, 12 step meetings that continued to check in on me that that really were a beacon of hope for me when I had none. I had women who had gone through horrible situations and made it out onto the other side and could give me hope. So at this point in my recovery, I'm like becoming a little bit more aware that I can I can trust females. Um, and that was huge for me because not only did I not trust females when I first got out here. I don't think I really trusted anyone. I especially didn't really trust myself. I wasn't at a point where I felt I could be vulnerable and open and honest without being severely judged um, or ridiculed or, or something. Um, but so this, this was an important time for me because I learned that I could depend on some people around me. Um, that I could call a friend when things were getting bad and go stay with her with my daughter. Um, so I, during this time, am also trying to stay sober. I'm doing my step work again. I'm, I had my first um, CPS involvement at this point because of the case that we had. They came in and interviewed us. Um, and of course, everything's great. Everything's fine. We don't need services. And when they read the re police report, they decided to open a case and it came in and I had to meet with the person every day. Um, and this was also another really important thing for me in my life was to realize that there's services out there that can actually help me. Now, was I 100% honest and ready to take on those services at that time and trusting that it was there to help me? Absolutely not. Um, but... I know that's something that changed a lot for me in my journey as well. So I, that all closed out and I think a few weeks went by and when I drink, I'm a binge drinker. So I can go for, or I could go for, you know, a few weeks and not drink, but then I would drink once and not be able to stop for like four or five days. Um, so this happened. And when this happened, I missed my probation appointment. And so my husband decided to call the police on me um, for a welfare check because he had taken our daughter and left. Um, and really, I can tell you that, so this was March of 2016 and his birthday was coming up that weekend. His birthday that year fell on Good Friday. Um, and so I felt like he just had this whole plan to get me out of the picture, to go do whatever he wanted to do. And so I wind up in jail and there I am, um, too intoxicated to go in front of the judge on Good Friday. So lucky me, I got to stay the whole weekend. Um, and when, and so like the whole weekend I'm, I'm planning and I'm thinking in my head, I 
I'm like, I know I've heard of this place called Clearview, or I, I know about Clearview because of Sacred Heart and that they help with women and they can help with housing and they can help with all these things. So this is going to be it. Like, I have to give up alcohol. I have to leave. I have to change everything. Um, because at this point, I'm terrified of CPS. I'm terrified of just everything. Um, and I, I can't seem to get out of this hole that I'm in. And I felt very stuck. Um, so Monday morning, I got pulled out of my holding cell. And I thought that um, I was going in front of the judge. So I, it was with a CEO and he brought me down this weird hallway, um, which unfortunately I know the way to go to talk to the judge and I knew we weren't going that way. So I asked where we were going and he said, you'll see, you'll see. Um, and when I got to this room, I'm in shackles and CPS is sitting there and I thought, oh, here he goes. He's going to try to take a run at rights and he's going to try to take my daughter and all of the things. And the guy really wouldn't say anything to me. Um, he did tell me that my daughter was fine. And then a detective walked in and when he walked in, um, he basically said, there's no way to give bad news. And I asked for him just to say it fast. And he said that um, your husband overdosed and passed away um, and that your daughter was found in her crib fine, but his family um, you know, is coming to ID the body and, um, and you know, CPS is involved and all of the things. So then I, from shackles and in my orange jumpsuit, um, I'm put back in the holding cell to kind of process what has just happened. Um, and I, I was in shock. I was in denial. Um, I was all over the place. Um, and so about an hour later, I go in front of the judge. Um, so I went in front of Monahan in St. Clair County um, and he helped save my life that day. He told me, I thought for sure that he would let me out with how horrible everything had, what had just happened. I needed to make plans. I needed to do all of these things. Um, and he told me that you know, my daughter lost her dad that day and she wasn't going to lose her mom, um, that I was going to go to treatment. And uh, it makes me so emotional just thinking about that and how upset I was <laughs> with that man who now I've been able to walk up to and thank. Um, because had he not done that, I most certainly would not be here today. Um, that was a detrimental moment in my life that set me on the path that I needed to go on. I was finally at the point where I was broken. Um, I had been that chronic relapser who would go in recovery, get things back and go back out, go in recovery, get things back and go back out and just rebuild and rebuild and rebuild. I actually became pretty good at doing that. But this was a different kind of, you hear about bottoms in recovery. Um, and I thought I was a bottomless pit at one point, but really I had hit a new low that um, was not just a material uh, getting things back or losing my freedom. It was losing everything in life as I knew it. Um, and so I uh, went from jail to Sacred Heart. I got out of Sacred Heart and I was pretty much on autopilot. Um, just doing whatever I needed to do. How do I get my daughter? How do I get things back together? How, you know, how to, like, where do I even start? Um, so what happened was I had a court date and at this court date, they told me that my daughter was placed with his family who we did not know. And who all I really knew about them was that they were pretty dangerous people. Um, and that the state of Michigan wasn't willing to move her because there needed to be a reason to do that. And I was told that I could either get the ball rolling on the foster care process or I could fight it. And if I fought it, it could take months for a court date to come back up 
And then at court, it could be decided it needed to happen anyways. So I did what I thought any logical parent would do. And I got the ball rolling. Um, unfortunately, not really knowing what I was even about to get involved with. And that was the foster care system. So I had a worker um, and I just, you know, I, I did whatever I could because I was horrified that all of this was happening. I don't think I slept very much or ate very much during this entire period of time. I, during this time, had to go to trial with the person who um, found my husband deceased. There was a lot more to that story. And so that was an entire trial that played out that I had to be on the stand for um, and reliving all of those moments. I made it through all of that um, because of the support around me. I had these people that would just show up and help me out however I needed. And they were all people who were in recovery. They were all relationships I had made in, in good times in my life. And they stuck around through the worst of the worst. Um, so I, I found out that I was like one of the fastest cases that St. Clair County had ever had. Within six months, I had my daughter back into my home. Um, things were looking good. They were looking up. I got a new a new townhouse, I got a new car, I was doing everything I could and more to like, just make sure all of this horribleness was behind us. Um, but again, I was not taking care of me, I was not taking care of my grief, of myself, of my recovery, of my accountability for where I played a part in all of this. Um, because I almost was in this mindset that, you know, my husband did all of this because of his choices. And I have to go through all of this because of what happened, um, which, you know, is, is a part of grief. You go through some anger with that. And I think I lived in anger for that first year. I was very upset. Um, I bounced between anger and depression pretty badly, but I also didn't know what was going on with me. I was just going through the motions. So, um, during this process, there were a lot of services that were recommended that I did. Um, one of the most beneficial ones was a service through PCC. They had two social workers come in and sit with me and prepare for reunification and pre prepare for my daughter to come home. And it was finally like I felt listened to. I felt like I could kind of trust them. Um, but the problem was I was terrified of telling people that I didn't feel good enough for my daughter to come home because where would she go if I said that? Um, at one point, she about a month before she was returned to me and his family found out that they weren't going to be able to keep her, um, they gave her up and she went into an emergency foster care situation. Um, so that was all very, very traumatic. So my daughter was about two years old at this time. And so when she, um, when she came home, I just kind of wanted everybody gone again. I didn't want to sit with people anymore. I didn't want to talk about relapse prevention. I didn't want to go through it all. I just wanted to move on with my daughter. Um, and unfortunately, again, the disease is, can be so powerful and cunning that as soon as they closed my case, I decided that I could probably handle to have wine with dinner. And within a few days, I um, was arrested for a DUI with my daughter in the vehicle. Um, and as shameful as that is, that's the really important part of this story is that we as people in recovery can come back from anything um, if we get out of the way. And so the, the day that that happened, I again was like, I was suicidal. I didn't want to live. I wanted, I went and I parked at a church down the street from my house and I yelled at God a little bit. And I told him like, I don't know what you want from me. I can't do this anymore. Um, and I just know, I, I knew that I needed to be out of my home with my daughter so she could be found. Um, and before I was able to complete anything, um, I was arrested. So I always tell everyone that I was rescued for the last time by handcuffs. 
um, it, which is never the white horse that you expect to ride in. Um, but that situation saved my life. I, and saved my daughter's life. Um, that, so coming back from that was very, very difficult. I, my worker who had, I had for my first case, I now had for my second case. And she told me, um, in the hospital that I did not deserve to be a mom, um, that I was a monster and that they were going to be terminating my rights. Um, so I was like, all right, well, like what is like what's the point? Um, and I don't know. I mean, to me, it's God, but something happened to me that was outside of myself, which is I I held on to this like shred of hope that that wouldn't happen. Um, that maybe this was like the the last chance. Maybe this is a thing that would like shake me awake. And I prayed and I cried and I prayed and. So I went in front of a panel of CPS workers who interviewed me um, to, you know, but so before that, back up a little bit, I was in jail when they came to the nice glass screen there to let me know, give me the paperwork that they were moving forward, um, you know, with the removal and uh, talking termination and that I would have to be interviewed to see if that would happen. So I go into this interview when I'm out and um, they, uh, it was like 10 strangers in front of me. And thank God I had two women from recovery uh, come with me and they, um, they advocated for me on my behalf when I, I didn't even have the words to say. I believed that I didn't deserve to be a mom. I believed that I was like the lowest of the low. Like, how could I ever do this to the person I love more than anything that I just fought to get back? Um, you know, I deserve whatever these people are telling me. And these women said, no, like she is not a monster. She's sick. She needs help. Like let her get help, give her a chance. And by God's grace only, I got a chance and that is all it took. Um, that was it for me. I knew that this was it. Like this was my last chance. I was able to take that sincere step one that you hear about in 12 step recovery sometimes of like admitting complete defeat. I was always able to say, oh, I'm powerless, you know, when I'm in jail um, and that my life is obviously a little unmanageable. But really admitting like, I can't have one of anything. If I have one of anything, then I don't get to decide what happens next. Like I lose that choice. Um, so a lot of amazing things happened this time around. I was honest with the foster care people, which that was crazy in itself because I feared them. Um, I had no idea that I could use them as a very important resource to help me um, to get resources, to get bedding or beds or whatever I needed. I had no idea that they could actually help me. I had this mindset that they just wanted to harm me and, uh, take my child. Um, and then that second go around again with PCC was even better because I was completely honest about my fears. Um, about how I wasn't sure I could handle everything, about let's get a plan together for when I do feel like that. I was able to really take advantage of all of the services coming my way. Um, you know, my outpatient therapy, like everything, it just was like a night and day difference. A big thing that I worked through that second time was um, my grief. So I had never, I kind of just, you know, put it in my pocket and tucked it away and it grew and grew and grew and transformed. Um, and so I went to a place in town called Bridge Builders. They had this really great grief group and it was just me and one old guy. And we just sat there and cried together sometimes, but it helped me car car compartmentalize that and that I had a day to go deal with that. Um, instead of just avoiding, 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 I had a day to go process this with a group of people. And that was very important. Um, I became much more transparent. Um, I started to learn that transparency was the key to a lot of things in my life that by 
um, fortune telling, like I knew what other people were thinking or what they wanted to hear, I was always doing myself a disservice. Um, if I really wanted to be a good mom, which is my entire goal in life, then I had to be as, um, as honest as I could be with everyone around me, no matter if that meant it was going to take longer, no matter if that meant maybe it raises some red flags. I had to just do everything to make sure that this was it. Um, and so I, it became very important to me to um, give back in areas that I once felt in bondage to. So I, when I moved out to Port Huron, one thing that I did the entire time was I continued to bartend. Now I haven't met too many sober bartenders, but I believed that I would be one of them. Um, and I learned that that wasn't gonna work. And that was part of CPS telling me that's not gonna work. You need to go work at a Coney Island that serves zero alcohol. Um, so I did, I went and, and that was a humble experience for me because I was used to making a certain amount of money and, and having, you know, a, a way to do things or, or know that I was always going to make my bills. And then I went to making a lot less than I was used to, but I had to just trust that like I would be taken care of and that if I'm doing the right thing, the right thing will happen for me. And it was scary, but I walked through fear and I was fine. I was absolutely fine. I was able to go to more meetings because I didn't work as hectic of a schedule. It was wild that it ended up turning out even better than it did when I had bar hours. Um, and then from there, um, I decided, you know, I've been sober for, I think I was going on my 18 months and someone suggested that I apply at Sacred Heart. And I thought, I'll do it, but you know, I don't know if, if they're gonna hire me. I, I don't know about my record, all of the things. And um, so I did it and I got hired there and it was the coolest experience ever um, to be able to give back at a place where I, couldn't make it through a few points was very, very rewarding. Um, it, it started to ignite this passion that I have for helping others. It started to show me that my pain has purpose and I just had to plug that into the right outlet. Um, so with that said, you know, losing John, my husband, I, every day I would go to Sacred Heart, if I could help one guy get it, that was like the best living amends ever to give to my husband. If I could plant seeds for other people, for them to, you know, look at recovery a little bit different or have a little bit of hope, then, um, you know, maybe his, maybe losing him didn't have to hurt so bad. Um, and so I worked my way up from RCT, which is a residential care technician to a peer recovery coach. Um, and then I, um, the next area that I was passionate about serving in was obviously CPS and foster care. So I found out um, that there was something called the Guy Thompson Parent Advisory Council through MDHHS that I was able to serve a term on. And that was a really cool experience. Again, gave me purpose in my pain um, and, and in this experience, I got to go sit on boards with senators and talk about changing policy and CPS or changing safety planning. Um, and they utilize parents that have been through any area of it, um, their lived experience to try to change um, on you know, a major level. So that's another really great thing. If you have anyone that has any experience with that, I know they're always electing positions. Um, but so that was really cool. That was like another checkbox for me. And so the last piece for me to serve in was um, criminal justice. And so this position came along in MDOC and I immediately said, no way am I getting that job. Like they're gonna, run my name and it's a wrap. And, um, and so I have a friend in recovery who told me I don't know anything about anything and just try it. And I'm so grateful for people like that in my life because I did it. 
and I got an interview and I got the position and I today am um, right now one of six peer recovery coaches in probation and parole offices in the state of Michigan. So we're in three different counties. St. Clair County is one of them. Um, and our program is expanding to nine additional counties in a few months. So it's been really, really neat to serve people that um, I was shocked. A lot of the clients that I was getting in the beginning had never even been to treatment. You know, they've been uh, in corrections or stuck in the system or getting out of prison and learning more about their disease was something that um, was not very prevalent. And so recovery coaching in general in corrections has been just such a cool experience. Um, I'm really excited about where this will go. I get to work with some of the coolest clients in the world and, and utilize um, my hope and my experience um, to tell them like anything's possible. And look at me, like they hired me in St. Clair County Probation and Parole. Don't tell yourself that there's not more out there for you. Um, so that's been really, really neat. Um, quite the God thing for me. Um, and life today is great. I am a mom, uh, full time. I don't have anybody telling me, you know, I, you need to make a doctor's appointment for your daughter or we need this paperwork. Um, I've been a full time mom for a, a while now. Um, I make all the decisions for my daughter. I get to cuddle on her every night and love on her every morning. Um, I get to drop her off at school and pick her up. And that alone is a miracle. Um, that is something that I almost gave away. Um, and that, uh, I mean, that's like the most beautiful part of my story really is, is to be able to have that relationship. Um, and then I am planning a wedding. I'm getting married in July. Um, and it, I, what else? I am, like mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm back in school. So ironically enough, through my adolescence and just like, you know, being all over the place, I didn't think I could even go to school. And not only did I go back to school um, as a little bit of an older adult, but I've been on the president's honor list like every semester. So that's been a super rewarding experience too just to learn that a lot of these beliefs I held about myself just were not founded um, was big for me. And there's no way I could have done any of this without all of the help and all of the support from the people around us or around us, around me. Um, you know, one thing I, I say all the time to my clients is we are the five people we surround ourselves with. And I, I make sure that I continue to check that circle constantly, you know, if somebody is not performing or if somebody's back out using, or if somebody is being dishonest, like that is not a person that I want to spend a lot of my, and invest a lot of my time and energy into. So my relationships today are awesome. Um, I'm so grateful for my friends in recovery, um, friends really that have become family, um, some which I think are on this call. I can't see the participants though. Um, and I just am so, I'm grateful for all of you listening to me. I'm grateful for being asked to do something like this as a person who really didn't even believe that I had any destiny beyond, um, you know, making it to the liquor store before 2 a.m. It is just such a miracle of what can happen when we get out of the way. And um, I'm, I'm grateful to not only have that realization, but to be able to advocate to others that that's a real thing. So uh, um, thank you for letting me share. I know we're opening up to some questions, I believe at the end. All right, thank you, Amanda. A lot of comments um, in the chat for thanking you for sharing your story, your honesty, how powerful the story is, um, just how the transparency regarding your recovery story really makes just really is a, is a wonderful story to hear. So thank you for that. Um, we do have a couple of questions, Amanda, so we're going to go ahead and go through them. The first question or one of the questions I should say is, in what ways can therapists and caseworkers make changes to reach levels, to, I'm sorry, to make changes 
to reach clients on a deeper level? That's a really great question. Um, so really, I know for me, I can only speak from my experience. Um, feeling that I had a safe place was very important. I know that um, another, I advocate to clients constantly that if you're with a therapist that you don't feel like you can be open with and let's get somebody else, like somebody else is out there that you can mesh with. Um, it is unfortunately a hundred percent up to the client to, for their level of openness and honesty. But I do think that knowing that anything they tell, especially people that are um, on paper or dealing with CPS in any way, um, knowing what they would say that would be reported is important um, because that can help them feel possibly more safe in sharing um, other things. Great. So you're saying therapists, um, clinicians, those helping professions, really trying to be very transparent and open and honest with what information they're going to share and what things can be um, not shared was really helpful for you as well, too, and helped you feel a little bit more safe in that connection with that individual. I like what you said, too, about folks, you know, finding somebody that meshes with you. You know, I always have the talk about, you know, you can go into a store and all the shoes your size can fit you, but they're not always comfortable for you. So right. it's really important finding that pair of shoes that's comfortable. And it sounds like, you know, that mesh part is all right. And reminding clients or therapists or professionals that if you're not meshing with someone, it's okay to not, to not mesh with someone. So, yeah. Um, another question that came from, and it kind of went around with what you said, um, but what you were talking about, the fact that being very, sort of on edge or guarded, feeling like everyone at the beginning was out to harm you um, mm -hmm. versus help you and how that was a process for you. And any other things that you can talk about what really helped bridge that gap? You had just said finding, feeling safe was a big part of it. Anything else that was a part of being able to switch from that and realizing that folks were out there, no matter what their role is, was there to help. Um, so I do think, I know my therapist at Clearview worked with me a lot about core beliefs. And when I started to learn how to challenge some of my belief systems, I would say that I was able to be a little bit more open to allowing people to get past the tough exterior. Um, I carried a lot of trauma that I didn't feel safe talking about. Um, and so just having education on ways to um, cope, I think helped me a lot and, and things to work on outside of therapy as well. Another question from the chat is, do you still attend meetings? How long do you think a person in recovery should attend meetings? And how, meeting, how many meetings a week is necessary? That's a really great question. So recovery looks different for each person. Um, meetings are only a small part of my recovery. I do still attend meetings, definitely not as much as I used to. Um, I have learned there's you know multiple pathways to recovery and through peer coaching, I've learned a lot about the different pathways and I've explored different pathways. So I'm always on a healing journey to um, change my direction and, and grow more. I know for me personally, the gym is huge. Um, it's become spiritual and a meditation routine for me. Um, so just things like that can be part of recovery. So the rigidness of like, you must, I do think the 90 and 90 meetings is great. It's a great suggestion. Um, I do think that meetings for a while is good. I would say as my daughter got older and, and my life started changing, um, meetings started to, to fall off less and less. You know, we did all go through COVID. Um, I would do Zoom meetings, but today I go to them, um, you know, once in a while. It's not as big of a reliance for me anymore. Today, I have 
different things that I rely on and, um, and church is a really big part for me too. You talked at the beginning a lot about there were so many needs and things that had to be done and things that seemed like they were these pressing issues and the self-care always got sort of pushed over and not seen as an important, but how important that role was. So one of the questions is, how do you find balance now? How do you know when to say no and just be able to engage in self-care? Uh, well, balance, I'm not sure is real sometimes, um, but self-care is very important to me. So I've learned a lot of self-care through learning more about boundaries and how to set those boundaries um, effectively. I've learned I've learned that I cannot do it all um, and that asking for help is, is not um, something to be prideful about. It can be a superpower. Um, when I let people know that I need help, then I have help. Um, so being, I think, again, transparent enough to not need to do it all is a big part of my self-care. So I'll, I'll speak on Every day I start my day, I have a morning routine. I spend my time with God in the morning and then I go to the gym in the morning. And that is me pouring into my cup for the day. Working in probation and parole can be taxing after a while. Um, but if I'm starting my day with what fills me, then I'm able to better fill others um, around me. When I break away from that, when I start sleeping in, I will notice that things seem to be a little uneven. Um, so just not being rigid about my self-care, but knowing that I need to schedule it is something that's important for me. You've talked about your role as a peer recovery coach, and I think that's sort of a newer sort of concept or not a lot of people are familiar with that, especially like you said, not only is it going well and has a lot of um, you know, makes a lot of impact on folks. It's also being expanded so much too. Can you talk a little bit more about exactly what, you know, a peer recovery coach is, um, what it takes to become a peer recovery coach and a little bit more about what you do in your role as a peer recovery coach? Yeah, so a peer recovery coach is just a person that lives with the disease uh, or lives with a substance use disorder and has made it to the other side. Um, they've gone through training at the state level um, after two years and some letters of recommendation, um, it's like a week long training to get certified to become a peer recovery coach. So at this, when you're at a peer in each setting, it's a little bit different, but you're essentially, what I do daily is walk hand in hand with people who are just being paroled back to the community. Some people have been gone for, you know, 13 years and they're just getting back out, um, and a peer is able to kind of step in as a buffer um, and a resource guide. So we have all these different resources. We have information about uh, what kind of outpatient would help, what kind of MAT is in this area, um, more information about what to expect out of meetings, what, to, what kind of pathway they're looking for. Um, for so for our peer peer recovery in MDOC in St. Clair County is actually really cool because it's a little bit different than the other counties. When I got this position, I advocated to get into the jail. Um, and that's been huge. So we are in St. Clair County Jail. We hold groups there um, every week, and they're just peer run groups. Um, and we've also advocated for more support in the jail too, because peer recovery coaches can really be such a help in a place like that, where a lot of people leave out the front door with a plastic bag and they walk down Michigan Road and they have no idea what is next or, or where to even go. So if a peer can get in there and um, fill that void of getting them set up with an outpatient, getting them set up with a ride to a rehab, getting them set up with three quarter housing, that's huge. Um, getting them set up with Vivitrol, whatever it is. Um, and, and there is an MAT peer already at um, St. Clair County through Sacred Heart, but we were the first group to come in and just kind of start these peer led groups, which I know Odyssey is now going to be doing as well, which is super exciting. The more help we can get in there, the better. 
um, and hopefully see some big changes from that on the other side. So a peer is really uh, just a source of hope and strength for a person that has ever struggled in the past with a substance use disorder and hopefully leading them to a resource or resources that can help them get on their feet more successfully. Last question is for a family member, a loved one that's just completely exhausted. Mm -hmm. Any words of advice or wisdom for those folks that are supporting individuals in, in their recovery or that feel very frustrated or very scared? Any, any words of advice for them? Um, don't give up. I, I believe that, you know, I was at a point where I think a lot of people kind of gave up on me. Like I was a lost cause. Um, and I felt that I knew that people didn't believe in me and I don't, I don't know that that was helpful at that point. Um, I can't imagine what you're going through. I know how hard that that can be. And I do know there's help out there for you as well. Um, there's groups like Al-Anon, there's like Families Against Narcotics does family coaching for free. Um, you know, finding resources, even if you just Google resources by you, um, calling a peer recovery coach to, that you know, like me, I would be happy to help with resources. Um, you don't have to do it all alone. Thank you, Amanda. Um, again, a lot of comments and different things coming through about you just sharing your story, a lot of empowerment, a lot of hope, a lot of transparency, and everyone really appreciates it. We appreciate you. And on behalf of um, the Recovery Summit and everyone that's viewed today, thank you so much for your time and your story. We, we appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thank you. All right. So with that, we are in our conclusion of today's presentation. Um, we just want to remind everyone that there are still sessions coming up for the Recovery Summit. We're running all the way to September 30th. There is still time to register for all of the presentations coming up and as a little bit of a movie trailer or a commercial. Tomorrow, which is Friday the 23rd, starting at 10 a.m., we have the session Treatment Options and Accessibility of Substance Use Services in St. Clair County with Tom Seilheimer and Lonnie Sharkey. And uh, next week on the 27th, which is Tuesday, um, very interesting presentation, the link between eating disorders and substance use with Lori Kehoe. The 28th Wednesday is motivational interviewing to promote engagement and SUD treatment. That is actually with myself. So I'll get to join a lot of you and spend a good hour talking about motivational interviewing strategies and um, some out of the box and other ways to think about engaging folks in their recovery journey. Thursday the 29th is contingency management, and we wrap up on Friday the 30th at 9 o'clock in the morning, how to talk to your teen about substance use with folks from the health department, Elise Nichols and Cassidy Livingston, who I believe um, presented on the 16th, they talked about emerging drug trends uh, with youth and a lot of positive feedback about them and their presentation, as well as all of our presenters. We, we greatly appreciate their time and their expertise. So with that, we'd like to say have a wonderful rest of the day to everyone. Remember again, that everyone will re receive their certificates or their CEUs at the very end of the presentations, um, at the end of, of uh, the recovery summit, you will get it after that. Um, you will get it in October and it'll be a sheet with all of the presentations that you attended because we're getting a lot of questions wondering, hey, when am I gonna get that? So it gives you a little bit more. Again, visit our YouTube on sccmh.org. You can visit our YouTube and look at the majority of the presentations that we've had today. Those will be up and running for a while. I know myself, I've missed a couple that I really want to see. So that's a great place to go there. Share information with others. Please spread the word about all of these great presentations and videos with other professionals, other folks in the community. They are available to anyone as a great resource at fingertips. And hopefully people will gain information, education, and inspiration on whatever recovery journey you have going on in your life or the life of others. So with that, everyone have an amazing rest of the day um, and take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.